Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Dr. Tahir Danish, and I'm the executive director of Persia Educational Foundation. It is my pleasure today to welcome two of our favorite um, friends of Persia to this webinar. Um, as you may have noticed on our social media, there is a fantastic new book out about the history of music in Iran that uh, one of our presenters today, Mr. Seper Haddad, has authored recently. And the book's been receiving a great deal of positive feedback and attention in different corners. So um, through um, this fantastic creation, we have come to know um, uh, Shaheen Shahida and Seper Haddad, and we're incredibly pleased to have the pleasure of having them with us this afternoon to talk about their music, to talk about their writing, and to talk about their contributions to the global community through their passion for Iran music, both Iranian music and world music. So welcome once again, dear Seper and Shaheen. Thank you so much for accepting to be with us this afternoon. If you would, um, you. please um, start by telling us a little bit about the uh, genesis of, of your musical duo and how you came to know each other and work together. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Saper, of course. Uh, glad to see Shaheen. Because of the pandemic, we hadn't had a chance to see each other. So this is a fantastic opportunity. I appreciate it. And we thank the Persia Educational Fund for this uh, opportunity. Um, Shaheen and I were high school classmates in Tehran International School in Iran Zami, and in Tehran back in the 70s. And Shaheen was a very sought out after uh, friend because he played the guitar beautifully. And so at many parties, Shaheen would have his guitar and would perform and um, I, I was a fan myself of Shaheen <laughs> until we came to the United States and we um, got together again in Washington, D.C. And at first we did a few just solo projects um, out of our joint interest. We both were interested in uh, the literacy campaign that Barbara Bush, uh, the wife of George Bush, had uh, uh, started. And we did a song for her literacy campaign um, and also the Brazilian soccer team. Uh, we were a fan of uh, Brazil during the World Cup, and they wanted music for their practice sessions uh, that they would blast in loudspeakers so that they could play as if um, there's an audience there during their practices. And so we also wrote a song for the Brazilian soccer team. And after that, uh, we got a lot of interest in, in terms of, well, why don't you guys do an album together? And we didn't really take it seriously, except for the fact that we would get together and record and without Shaheen knowing sometimes I would press the record button. And after the sessions, I would play these back. And finally we had about 12 of these songs and we decided to send it to uh, some record companies. And um, we got two offers out of the many uh, places we sent it to. And um, I'll let Shaheen go on with the rest of the story from here. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for inviting us, uh, Dr. Danish. It's a pleasure being with you and an honor to be affiliated with your foundation. Um, just to uh, elaborate on what Saper was saying, uh, he, he was kind of uh, sneaky in that he was recording whilst I was just playing and I had no idea that we're being recorded. And perhaps that was the secret uh, you know, magic of this uh, ensemble. He was recording these songs and uh, actually the way it worked, he would present me with a canvas, if you will, musical canvas that he had prepared uh, on the keyboards. And he'd say, here, I got this rhythm, I got this keyboard, just see what you come up with it. So not being mindful of the recording button, you know, I just played and he recorded um, on the first session, like four songs. And this might have been like on a weekend. And then on the Monday, he called me and said, hey, by the way, I recorded you and you should hear this. He said, what? What are you talking about? Um, he said, well, I'll send you a cassette by mail because we didn't have Internet those days. And he sent me the cassette. Long story short, um, it was encouraging enough that we pursued another uh, two or three sessions. And in the course of four 
sessions, we were able to come up with an album worth uh, of material, which uh, we then decided to uh, you know just put it out locally through our local record stores and bookstores and and um, it it actually caught on. So it, we felt encouraged and we decided to uh, send a copy to the radio station, the local jazz station. Um, and Saper, do you remember, remember the name of the station? Was it W W L L T W Light in Washington? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it was kind of like a light rock meets jazz uh, station. But um, it was good enough to encourage us to actually pursue uh, record labels and uh, Saper being the ever resourceful partner that he is uh, he went ahead and gave me a list of I remember this number for some reason 18 record labels and out of the 18 we got 16 rejections <laughs> but we did get two acceptances uh, one was from a Sony affiliate in San Francisco and the other was in Malibu High Rocktive and we ended up going with them High Rocktive Music had just uh, had tremendous success with Otmar Liebert. He was the highest selling guitar act ever, actually higher than you know a lot of other well-known artists. So they were kind of hot for more uh, of that genre. Um, so anyway, long story short, that's how we embarked on this. Uh, I think it ended up being a six album uh, contract with High Rockton. And, uh, and I have to interject here, of those 16, one of them was a very, um, was a company that we were really excited to go ahead and record with. And they, instead of just saying thanks, but no thanks, which were most of the letters, this one, they had actually written a, like a one and a half page letter saying, you know, we really listened to it. Our marketing department did their research and there's no viable market for this kind of music currently. Wow. And then six months later, when we got signed and the record was released, it was number six on Billboard charts. And Shaheen has that in a folder, the two letters, the, the sixth on the Billboard charts and the rejection. And that's what we tell young and aspiring artists, never give up, no matter what. Even if the experts tell you that you should give up, you shouldn't give up. If you believe in your product, and Shine and I really did, we, we, we would play this music for friends and family, and the response was so overwhelming that we all of a sudden got a confidence that, you know, we'll do it ourselves, even if the record company doesn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And luckily, it worked out that a record company did want to do it. <laughs> but uh, it's always interesting to see how these big corporations make these decisions, yeah. and they're really not based on any market research. What a, what a fantastic message to give our audience, as you know, Persia, um, based on the vision of, of its founders and really strengthened by um, our board of trustees, um, really is focused on empowerment and, and enabling the younger generation, in particular Iranians in the UK and beyond, to really um, reimagine the world and to create a better reality for uh, their own selves and for the society at large. So it's fantastic to hear about this experience. I hope that whoever is uh, listening to this will, will be inspired to pursue the same path and have the same sense of perseverance and vision that, that you've had. Um, if, if you would, could you please share with us a little bit about your the roots of your interest in, in music and perhaps how that um, took you to um, um, the whole pursuit of creating music that is, uh, I guess, genre as wor world music? Well, um, when, when we were growing up in Tehran, uh, as you might recall yourself, there wasn't uh, a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, access to music that was, uh, you know, that was like uh, dominating the airwaves in the Western hemisphere. We were, uh, we only had the AFRT, which was American uh, Armed Forces Radio and Television that uh, used to play, uh, you know, the 
popular music of the times, you know, it, it was all this stuff that people were listening to here. We, we'd get a glimpse of that on, and I think it was only on the weekends that they aired that. So we had a very limited exposure. Um, so consequently, what we tried to do was emulate that scene, if you will, that sound by picking up our guitars. Cause I, you know, my interest in guitar dates back to like when I was a seventh grader and high school and my uncle gave me his guitar before he left for California. He said, here, I'm giving you my guitar. So that kind of set me off on my journey. Um, but, um, and then there were, you know, some American students in our school that did have the records and the blues albums and the rock albums. And they would, each one of them would give us a uh, little, you know, tip or lesson, if you will, of, the song. So that's where it all began for me, where I was uh, listening to music from the West and um, trying to recreate it by playing, you know, we would get these cassette copies of someone's album. <laughs> and then we just play it back over and over and trying to figure out the chords and the melodies and whatnot. So, and of course, uh, shortly thereafter, I, I had a band in high school that you know, consisted of some of the uh, international students. And of course, they each had their own influences. So it was kind of blues meets rock at that juncture. But then at home, we were listening to, I mean, I wasn't, but my parents were listening to Persian classical. So that was kind of being uh, seeping into our psyche as well. And uh, so it, what would happen is, uh, you know, we would reject that at the time because it was too traditional and too classical and not anything to do with our long hair and whatnot. <laughs> so, uh, but further on down the line, all that came back to kind of reintroduce itself when in the States we started meeting uh, some of the fantastic classical Persian musicians uh, who I've actually worked with and had in my studio. So uh, it all kind of like did a full circle of, you know, going around the world, learning all these other genres. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wow, I love the Persian Kamanche or I love the Santur, you know? And so Seper and I started um, dabbling in, in that, um, you know, in that uh, genre as well. And that's where we started uh, bringing in Persian melodies. Um, some people would say, oh, it sounds like you got uh, Arabic scales going on. And I'd say, well, no, these are actually more Persian coming from the Daskos that we have. And uh, so, but to present those with the Spanish guitar, um, it kind of covered all gamuts, you know. Um, it, it, it spoke to people that liked Western music, but it also spoke to our parents who liked Persian music. So that's where the bridge kind of uh, was built between uh, our interests. Sorry, I, I feel like I'm going you, on too long. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. I, I, this is what you started then in Iran. And then when you came to the West, you continued, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Um, some of the some of the um, work that you've done has attracted a great deal of attention, and you've been invited to contribute to specific projects, like you mentioned the literacy campaign that you were a part of. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about some of the works you've done that have been more um, um, acknowledged, perhaps? Well, Shaheen has uh, done. Um some solo work, which has been amazing. The United for, uh, Unite for Change. Shine, uh, you should explain what that was all about. Yeah, the the uh, the campaign. It's called. Uh, that's the most recent one. It's uh, um, a call to unite, and that uh, was uh, or is uh, spearheaded by. Uh, Tim Shriver, who is Maria Shriver's brother, and um, Maria Shriver and Oprah Winfrey. They uh, decided during the pandemic that the world is so divided, um, especially during the uh, former administration uh, 
in Washington, uh, the, everyone felt that this division was just getting really, really profound and uh, uncontrollable as we witnessed on December 6th. So midway in, uh, in Trump's presidency, uh, this call to unite was established by Tim Schreiber and uh, they invited a whole host of uh, people from different uh, walks of life from uh, politicians to healers to poets and musicians and I was invited to perform a song and uh, I, uh, I kind of uh, had the opportunity to talk about my view on unity and how unity can be accomplished and it's absolutely from my own personal experience and I'm married to an American uh, spouse and my children are born in the United States and uh, um, like yourselves uh, from the diaspora. So my role all in my 20 years of marriage has always been to try and like introduce these different cultures to one another. And, um, you know, it's easier when you travel and they get to see firsthand, my children have been to Iran a number of times and they remember fondly um, their experiences there. So I tell them, look, you know, in every culture, there's good and bad. And if you can go and pick and choose what you really uh, appreciate from that culture uh, and create your own smorgasbord of, uh, you know, um, um, you know, um, of, uh, of what am I, the word I'm looking for, of cultural experiences that you can take, draw from and enhance other people's perception of who you really are so that they can understand you better. Instead of what people see on the news, which is not always favorable, uh, particularly when it comes to the country of Iran. So I, I felt this, um, you know, instinctive duty to educate. I think Sapir and I always, from the get-go, we were always trying to open people's eyes and minds. They're like, what, really, in Iran? You guys had rock and roll in Iran? Oh, really? Oh, you guys skied in Iran? I thought it's all desert land, you know. So, you know, you, you, <laughs> we were always on this mission, perhaps a little too overzealously at times, to promote, um, that which we know is true about our culture as opposed to what is being portrayed. By the, by the media, perhaps more than- By the media, media yes. Represented by the media, yeah. That's, yes. that's wonderful to hear because that seems to be a um, central theme that runs through some of our experiences as well, which again, points out the importance of education. In, in, in your case, you're using the uh, you're using music and the arts as a medium to increase education awareness about the reality of Iran and its contributions to the whole wide world throughout centuries. Yeah. Um, I wonder if, um, given the fact that music has been such a fantastic field in terms of um, awareness raising and, and activism among Iranian youth over the past couple of decades. Um, have you had any encounters with, with young people in particular because you have traveled to Iran? Have you come across the, the sort of the Iranian music scene in Iran? Has anyone been in touch with you? Has anyone found any inspiration in your work? Have you had any encounters of, of this nature at all? Yes, actually uh, in my case, uh, because I've been there uh, a few times now, uh, every time I go to Iran, I have some fantastic musician friends that I call them or I email them. I say, I'm coming to town. Can you get the folks together for jam sessions? And uh, so my wife and my uh, mom, everyone will attest to the fact that when I'm there, the daytime I'm with them, but in the evenings I'm with these musicians and, you know, I, I'll take my recording gear with me. So I have hours and hours of recording from uh, musicians in Tehran and in Esfahan where my mom has moved to. Um, so yes, the younger generation there, I'm always in awe with, first of all, the ones that are in Persian traditional classical music, I'm always in awe with the level of um, work and hours they put into their instruments. So these are, 
if you want to compare them to Persian art, uh, like miniature, you know, uh, the Persian, uh, um, you know, handicrafts, as well as Persian carpet making, they truly have the same level of intricacies and hours of practice in their instruments. So I'm in awe of that. Uh, and then they appreciate the fact that someone uh, comes to them with a recording, uh, you know, devices and records them, but then also they'd like very much to fuse their sound with Western sounds. And that's where I come in and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll create a canvas, like I was saying, Sapir does for me, for them. And then uh, next thing you know, I've got some amazing, uh, you know, Persian tar player that's inspired to play differently than, you know, than what he might normally be doing. And then amongst the even younger ones, I've worked with Iranian uh, producers slash DJs that are fantastic. I mean, some of these younger, um, you know, uh, musicians there are just so, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're so good with their craft and I'm impressed with that, you know. I feel Tehran in general is just full of the hustle and bustle of art and artists and people that want to express themselves that don't necessarily have the chance to, you know, so. That's, that's fantastic yeah. to hear. It's, it's always, uh, um, I guess, uh, again, in some of the webinars we've had in the past, that's, that's, been, a, that's been a common theme that um, even though we're, we've been in the West or we live in the West, um, almost every single Iranian who's made a difference that um, is, is like yourselves, uh, prominent figures in our community, it, it's perhaps been their desire to give back, not only to the to the community we live in now, but to the motherland, to Iran, yes. that has enabled us to achieve what we have in life. And, and in, it's wonderful to hear that it's been the same with, with your music. So with that in mind, uh, Sepejan, do you wanna tell us a little bit about your book then? Because it seems like your love of music has taken you back to discover what's been part of your family, and in fact, part of Iranian history that perhaps we didn't know about until the publication of, of your wonderful book. Thank you. Well, uh, yes, uh, the reason I wrote the book in 1978, right before the revolution, I'd gone back to Iran for the last summer um, that I was there until I went back again later. But uh, I had not been in Iran for 35 years after my grandmother had told me this story about my grandfather. And it was during the martial law and there were tanks on the streets and there was, you know, police with uh, machine guns, and everybody walking around. So it was very um, new. It was a new feeling for me. I hadn't seen anything like that. And I write this in the book, except for in the movies. And so I felt I was in the midst of a movie. And um, I was telling my grandmother, I'm so surprised what's going on. And uh, they were just mentioning the name of Khomeini at the time, and I had never heard his name. And I told my grandmother, I said, I'm surprised. We went to the international school in Tehran. We had access to reading material that, um, you know, wasn't even available on the street because of the international school. And we were able to read all these materials, but we had never heard about him. And my grandmother told me that's not surprising at all. There's many things you don't know. And I said, like what? And she said, like your own grandfather. He fell in love with a Russian princess when he was in St. Petersburg studying music. And I was totally shocked, flabbergasted. And I was wondering what else is there that I don't know. And I, I wondered why I had never heard this story even. And so she began to tell me this story and which ultimately became the book. But in 2009, Rick Steves did a program on Iran. And he traveled to Iran. And my wife and I were watching that on TV here. And it just brought back all these memories and the nostalgia. And my kid at school, some kid had told him to go back to Iran. Uh, you know, and he didn't even know what the kid was talking about. He was born here. As Shaheen said, our children are, you know, they're Iranian American, but they had never seen Iran. So I told my wife, I said, I want to go to Iran. I want my kids to see the beauty of that country, to see the history. I want to take them to Persepolis, to stand there, to see where Alexander, supposedly the great, I don't call him that, I call him Alexander of Macedonia, because I don't consider anybody who destroyed our ancestors' realm the great. 
So um, we did that and we went to Iran and my children were 14 and 12 at the time. Mm. And we're sitting in a taxi cab going from Shiraz to Persepolis. And the taxi driver started speaking English to my wife, knowing that she's from America, very broken English. And I asked him, I said, where had you learned it? He said, at the garrison in Shiraz, the military garrison, when I was doing my military duty. And I said, oh, that's interesting. My uncle was the head of the garrison there. He was the commander of the garrison. And he asked my uncle's name. And I said, it's General Mimbashian. And he just pulled the cab to the side of the road in the middle of the highway. You know, he's like saluting me. And he said, I remember him. And what a nice, what a great man he was. And he actually helped bring English. So we'd learn English. And he went on and on. At that point, my wife said, you got to write this story. I mean, if a taxi driver in the middle of nowhere remembers your family, you got to write this because after you're gone, nobody will remember these stories. And so I came back and I decided to write this. And I told Shaheen, let's take a one year hiatus off. Why don't you go ahead and do what the things you're doing with the other artists? And I'll go ahead and write this book. Six years later, I sent him a book as a gift and it was an apology letter and it saying, I'm sorry, I misjudged the timing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yes, it's about my grandfather who went with his father, uh, Saul Armoazaz, who wrote the first Persian national anthem to St. Petersburg to study music with Rimsky Korsakov. And he comes back and there's a whole story, but during this time in St. Petersburg, he falls in love with a Romanov princess, the only niece of Tsar Nicholas II as becomes her, her piano tutor and then they fall in love. And then the rest of the story, of course, is in the book, but ultimately my grandfather comes back to Iran and becomes the head of the Iranian uh, Conservatory of Music. I, I suppose um, when you say the rest of the story, <laughs> uh, the rest of the accounts, because yes. as you mentioned, this is, this is a book that's based on actual events yes. uh, and occurrences, but of course you've, very masterfully have filled in those gaps that may be missing documentation with your imagination um, uh, that has really made the book an amazing uh, contribution to the history of our country, to the history of music, to the history of Russia. Um, as uh, um, some of our early conversations you may recall, um, I, I feel what is incredibly unique about this book is that it doesn't, although it, it contributes to our understanding of Iran because of the way it's written and because of the individuals involved, it, it lacks that overly zealous, protectionist, nationalistic, um, uh, toxic nationalistic kind of overtone. Rather, it really draws on the commonalities of some of the cultures that we share in our part of the world and it's beautiful in that sense because it really highlights um, the positive aspects of, of both Russia and Iran at a very turbulent time in our in our collective history and and the sacrifices that have been made and the family dynamics that you highlight are universal themes that I think anyone who reads the book could relate to even today. Well, uh, that, that's amazing that you you saw all of that in there. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm expecting a review uh, by you soon because it's beautiful what you said. But yes, uh, what's interesting about it is that in 1905, Russia was going through their turbulence for people wanting constitutional reform. And in 1906, Iran, they signed the constitutional documents that uh, gave us the constitutional monarchy and the parliament and the freedom of press, freedom of religion, all these things that uh, a lot of Western countries today aspire to and still cannot uh, get to uh, at that time in 1906. And to think the foresight, I always am amazed at the foresight my great grandfather, Salar Moazaz, Folam Razamin Bashan had, that in the age of 13, when, uh, when his son was 13, he takes him to Russia with him in 1898 to St. Petersburg to study. And there's a mirroring of his life and my own life, because at the time, Russia was kind of like the place to be. And now the U.S. is kind of like the place to be, kind of for diaspora. And so it really did mirror my own life in a way, him going away to study in another country. I came here to study uh, and then 
with plans of going back, of course, um, we didn't get to go back. We went back for visits, but not to go back. I studied agriculture so I could go and help, um, you know, make, uh, you know, basically help the agricultural uh, um, industry in Iran. So it's interesting in that regard. And I was able to put myself and my grandfather's shoes in some of these places when he talks about missing his family or being away from home, because we've all experienced that. Fantastic. Um, what kind of reception has the book had so far? It, it, it's newly released and has just come on Amazon and other sites. But tell us a bit about the kind of reception you've, you've had so far. Well, it's very interesting because Initially, if you see in the uh, dedications, I dedicated this book to my two sons so they never forget their Persian roots. And that really was the intent of the book, was just to leave a document for my family and for my sons so that once this generation is gone, they'll know about uh, their family and also about what a interesting and unique culture and history our country has. But... I wasn't expecting the uh, great reception it has gotten now. It's uh, last week it was number three uh, recent bestseller uh, for Russian historical fiction. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been getting a lot of requests for interviews and uh, there's actually been some Hollywood interest also. Uh, I wrote the book almost as a script. When I was writing it, uh, you know, a lot of people when they write, I think authors uh, the hope is that one day this will become a movie or a, or a miniseries. Uh, but then you're going to need a screenplay writer and a screenwriter to, to do that. I kind of started the book with the intent of it being a miniseries or a movie. So when you read it, you see it's a very visual book. Uh, and so um, I'm excited. But, you know, Shaheen and I have been in this business. And we know that a lot of things are said and a lot of plans are made. We were supposed to go to Iran uh, to do a live at Persepolis concert, Shaheen and I. And we had already uh, talked with PBS, the public television here in the United States, and uh, the draft had already been written. It was going to be a show called Echoes of Persia, sort of the, along the lines of Yanni's uh, live at the Acropolis. We were going to do live at Persepolis. Uh, he was Greek. He went to his country. We were Persian. We were going to go back to our country. Everything was set up. But unfortunately, uh, at that time, the war against Iraq happened and the producers got very nervous and they backed out. So Shaheen and I both know that a lot of plans are made. Your bags are packed. You're ready to go and it can all come to nothing. So I'm not pinning any hopes on that. I'm just excited about the way the book is being received. And also the fact that I think... Um, what it has in it is um, sort of a, as you said, it's not overly nationalistic in that way, but it does highlight the beauty of our culture, our music, our family relations, our traditions. And, you know, this is a culture that had the first world empire. So there must be things in it that are of interest and shouldn't be put under the carpet just because of the political situation or the way the media portrays us. Fantastic. Well, um, one of the things that I um, really loved about the book is um, the different dynamics of, of love that you have beautifully documented. Um, exactly as you said, be it family relationships. So the love of the, the dynamics of the love between fathers and sons, which is prominent in, 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 in our culture, but also the sacrificial love that exists among family members when it comes to um, romantic love and, and what um, we sort of view in our culture as elements that can influence our decisions in taking into consideration our feelings, our romantic feelings towards love versus family obligations. Would you like to say a little bit about that? Because that, as you said, if you've written the book with the intention of maybe it being, um, you know, made into a motion picture or miniseries at some point, it would be lovely to hear from you what you saw in this concept of love that, as we know, is one of the universal themes that, that emerges in, in uh, Hollywood productions usually. Well, thank you. Um, I think what's interesting is that when I was writing this, I was having difficulty. I never met my grandfather. 
So everything I know about him has either been through reading articles about him, listening to his music, or um, talking to my um, uh, uncles who are uh, my own mother. Uh, so when I was writing this, I was having difficulty kind of um, portraying him. And so the publisher said, why don't you put yourself in his place? And once I did that, it all of a sudden worked because the same feeling that my father and I, the love that my father showed me, but also the strictness of a Persian father, a strong-willed Persian father, and how we had to basically, we called it respect, but it meant basically you just do what they say and don't question it. Uh, there is a love in there, even though it's tough love. And so that love I was able to portray because there's this battle between my grandfather and his father as to what my great-grandfather thinks my grandfather should do and as opposed to what my grandfather himself thinks what he should do. And it's very apropos because Shaheen and I both being uh, songwriters and loving music, being musicians, uh, of course, Shaheen is a much more able musician than I am, but uh, we had to deal with that ourselves because coming from Iran, your family always wants you to be a doctor or an engineer or something, have a bureaucratic job, you know? And so at some point, my mother kept telling me, don't do this music stuff, don't do it. I was working for the EPA at the time uh, in the Office of Pesticides, uh, studying the dietary effect of pesticides on food. And my mother kept saying, it's good you and Shine are doing this uh, as friends and for having fun, but don't try to release it uh, commercially. And I kept saying, why? And she said, because if nobody likes it, then your feelings will get hurt. And, you know, the typical way of trying to protect you by saying, don't, don't go out. I'm trying to protect you by don't go out. And we were saying, no, no, we have to try it. We have to do it. And unfortunately, in our culture, and I've written that in the book, especially in the time of my grandfather, music wasn't considered the art form that it is now. And so music, even if you said you wanted to have music, music education or you want to have a conservatory, people would laugh at that in those days. They would say, no, 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 just go to a private person's house, the master, learn from him, and that's enough. Mm -hmm. And Shaheen and I also had to go through some of this, even here when we started, where my mom, when she would tell her friends, they'd say, yes, we've heard his music, it's very good. And my mom said, yeah, 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 but he also works for the government, he does, uh, you know, because they always wanted to throw that side of the, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Shaheen has had the same, I'm sure, the same experiences. Shaheen, <laughs> John, do you want to add to that a little bit from your personal perspective? Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's a very uh, accurate uh, depiction of, you know, the, the dialogue between the generations, certainly uh, the Persian, you know, families. Um, music in Iran, um, you know, didn't have the mass appeal. There was, you know... The classical music of Persia, um, there was a you know certain group that listened to that. There was a certain audience for that. The masses listened to very pop-oriented Persian stuff that you heard on the radio. So perhaps our parents were kind of seeing it through that lens and saying, well, music, you know, um, you know, listen to what's happening on the radio. Do you want to be the guy that's doing that, for instance? And, but, you know, when you're young and you have a passion and uh, certainly having been exposed to the Western, uh, you know, uh, style of music, we, we knew the palette was much broader than just these two, you know, avenues, either strictly classical or strictly pop. So we were able to use that vocabulary and create our own, you know, language, if you will. So, I mean, world music is a bit of a general misnomer. We, we never categorized ourselves um, as, you know, I've heard through various great people in the music industry. They say there's two kinds of music. There's good music and there's bad music. And um I heard that actually from Quincy Jones once. Uh, and I think that uh, there's certain truth to that. Uh, if your music is 
touching people, if it's really affecting someone, giving them goosebumps or making them nostalgic or making them travel in their mind, well, what better therapy can we ask for instead of, you know, taking mind altering medicine to feel better? Why not just put on a, uh, you know, a record? And I have a huge record collection here that people are wondering, like, why do you have all these LPs? And I'm like, because every one of these is a chapter of my book, of my life, you know, and when I listen to these, it takes me to a certain place and I, it reminds me of a certain time. So, um, yeah, so, there, you know, we had a bit of that challenge of trying to justify our interest in music, but I think my dad, uh, he himself used to play the violin. You know, he, like Sapir said, they always had a profession. My dad was a lawyer, so he had the, you know, the respectful profession, but then on the side, he loved to play uh, his violin and uh, he was into gypsy jazz music from the you know 1930s and uh, in France and you know so he he had his own youthful outlook too so I never got a lot of pushback from my parents even in Iran when we had jam sessions with a live drummer in our living room I never got uh, any complaints from my mom or dad saying, hey, you know, turn that down, <laughs> you know, because the drums can be very loud in the living room, you know. So, um, so in that sense, I, I think we were fortunate, but Sapir is absolutely right. Even until, even after we were on the radio uh, here in the United States, we, and you know, we got signed and within like several months, I think we were on over 500 radio stations around the country. And my parents would hear us on the radio when they'd come to visit or they'd see us on TV programs and whatever. And that's when they, it would hit home and say, oh, that's my son, you know, he's, he's on TV or he's on the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, but then to my face, they, they never really kind of like, you know, want, like Sapir said, I think they were trying to protect us from going down an avenue that might not bear the fruit that they hoped you know, we were seeking. I I remember two instances specifically where um, it, it hit home for me that now we've shifted from just doing it as a hobby to actually my parents and my children both kind of believing that maybe there's something to this music. <laughs> One was my father, when he asked me, he said, uh, he called me up one day urgently, you know, hey, do you have one of your CDs? I need one of your CDs right now. I said, oh, really? Why? What? He said, so-and-so, one of his very important friends had called him and said, I've heard their music. I love it. I really like it. Where can I get it from? That was the first time, I think, my father, when his friend called him and asked for it. And another time was when we went to Iran, we were in Shiraz Airport. Mm -hmm. And we went in Shiraz Airport they had a CD and a video and all that kind of a store. So the lady there said, what kind of music do you like? I said, because I was trying to see if I can find any Iranian artists that are doing what we're doing, instrumental guitar music. And so I said, instrumental guitar music. She said, I have something. And now this is all in Farsi. And my wife, who only speaks very little Farsi, just hello and goodbye type thing, yeah. was standing beside me. And she said, I have something that is great. It's a one gigabyte a CD has five albums of this group that are in America. Two guys, they do guitar. They're called Shaheen and Saper. And only for like 500 tamans or something. And I said, really? She said, yeah, I said, I want to see it. So she showed me the image on the computer and it was one of our albums that didn't have our faces on it. And uh, my wife turned to the lady and broken Farsi said, in Saper, in Saper to me. And the lady said, oh, how sweet. Your wife is saying your name is Saper too. And I said, no, <laughs> she's saying that that is actually me. And of course, she didn't believe until I took out my business card. And she saw it. And you should have seen the embarrassment on her face trying to sell me my own stuff. <laughs> and so that <laughs> then she blasted the music for like 10 minutes in the whole place. And I was very embarrassed. So we left. But my kids, that was the first time I saw my children actually believe that I was a musician. <laughs> that's, that's really an incredible story I guess that that in itself belongs in a book that you would go back to Iran you know with all the restrictions that exist in Iran um, yet the resourceful 
yeah. music loving Iranian population had found a way to find out about your your work and here they are trying to sell it back to you so that's that's yeah. quite, quite an amazing with story. no copyright of course uh, okay. many of the songs names were changed like we have a song called through your eyes uh -huh. uh, they had named it the red river <laughs> well, so. copyrights as you know do not apply in Iran so you know, <laughs> jurisdiction where anything goes um so in that in that uh, light, then would you both like to tell us a little bit about where people may be able to find your music? Well, we're on Spotify. I think that's the best place for people who like to stream music. Shaheen and Saper on mm -hmm. Spotify, and we have uh, quite a bit of a following, which is great. Uh, but also, it's available everywhere on Apple, Amazon, any music uh, outfit uh, mm -hmm. you can find it on. Okay. Tell, tell, tell us a little bit about some of the pieces that you've written that relate more to Iran, perhaps something about Persopolis, anything that really inspired Well, Persia, the, the one song that became a hit, it's actually uh, doing very well on Spotify, is Persia. And that is beautiful because Shaheen played it as if his guitar is an oud. I let him uh, talk about it more because he did it, actually. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, going back to the concept of internationalism and world music, uh, we experimented with a lot of uh, different rhythms. So Seper said, look, I, I, I like the rhythms of Brazil. So, and as he said earlier, we had done some music for the Brazilian soccer team during one of the World Cups. Uh, so as such, he played me a samba rhythm that he had programmed uh, on his computer and uh, there was no other music to it. It was just the beat and a bass line. So I picked up my guitar and I just started uh, improvising. And again, he started recording and that recording became the song Persia, which at first, I don't think it was even called Persia, but later on, I think we kind of decided uh, that might, because of the, you know, the, the ambience of the song and the mood that it- Well, my mother heard it in a car. I was playing the demo for her in the car of what you had done the night before. And I said, mom, yeah. look what Shaheen played, because my mom, our families are close. So she knew Shaheen. Uh, I said, look what Shaheen played, you know, and she listened to it. She said, what is it called? I said, we don't have a name. We have a working title. She said, call it Persia. And that, <laughs> I told Shaheen, yes. I said, we should call it Persia. He said, yes, exactly. It's Persian. So that's how it was. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so here you had a Persian melody on top of a Brazilian samba rhythm. And this was back in uh, the early 90s, you know. And now you can hear a lot of permutations of these different, you know, elements in people's music. Uh, so going back to the world music concept. So in that sense, you could call it world music because we were not drawing boundaries between, you know, cultures and uh, music. We weren't saying, well, I have to play classical Persian or I have to play classical flamenco or whatever. We were open to pick and choose, um, you know, and some purists might not uh, appreciate that, uh, you know, as purists often are. They, they, they prefer to, you know, stick to a certain, you know, like classical architecture, for instance. I, you know, they never uh, appreciated uh, modernist movements of the Bauhaus era. But um, you can't move forward if you're just stuck in one, you know, one idiom all the while. And it's the same exactly what you're saying in the book. Uh, uh, as you've seen, uh, Dr. Donish, that uh, my grandfather and great grandfather had the problem because uh, at the time there was no notation system in Iran. And so they brought over the Western notation system. He was the first person to introduce it. But trying to introduce this new music that they called it with symphonies and wind woodwinds and these kind of things uh, was difficult for them. They were meeting with a lot of resistance from the traditional Persian musicians. And so there is that little bit of a conflict in the book, even as you see it. And so um, I'm thinking ma many traditional Persian musicians may not like those particular chapters in my book because I do talk about that. Yeah, well, um, as, as we all know, um, the past century of Iranian history has really been symbolized by the tensions between tradition and modernity. And absolutely, your book does a fantastic job of 
um, showing not just um, that tension in, in the world of music, but in the institutional family, in the in the political zeitgeist that Iran and Russia were, were sort of traversing through at that point in time, and re relationships, I suppose, more than more than anything else. Um, um, I, I wanted to also ask if you could tell us a little bit about where your um, book could be found at the moment, if anyone's interested in, in um, getting a copy. Thank you very much. Um, you know, Amazon is always the quickest and the fastest to get it to you, but it's available on uh, Apple Books, it's available at Barnes and Noble and every bookstore. Uh, it's basically released, the publisher got it released in all countries everywhere. So I actually saw a copy in Vietnam and a copy in Japan and the one in Japan made me, reminded me of our childhood in Iran. We would go to the Bakali, which are these little stores that have almost everything you want, um, from little plastic soccer balls to, uh, you know, tied to wash your clothes, to bubble gum. And they had bubble gum, which was from Japan. And I loved this Japanese bubble gum and the, and the packaging of it. It had all these yens and all these colors and everything. And and so when, when I saw the book being advertised in Japan, it had the same look. I thought it was a piece of bubble gum at first. <laughs> now, uh, tell us whether there are any plans to translate your book into Farsi and perhaps Russian. Yes, we're speaking with people now to translate in Farsi. My concern uh, with uh, the book uh, for Iran was that I had noticed a lot of books that weren't translated uh, officially in Farsi by the publisher would then be taken to Iran and translated by either somebody who's very interested, just does it as a hobby, or actually some firm that wants to do it and sell it because there's no copyright laws. Mm -hmm. And I was very concerned that they would change um, stuff in the book. You know, I, I had already seen on my visit that the name of our song, Through Your Eyes, from our album Aria, had now been turned to the Red River. So I thought, oh my God, if I don't do something quick, somebody's going to take it and translate it and maybe translate it in a different way, because it's a very apolitical book, if you've noticed. Uh, and it's not that I didn't want to write a political book or I did want to write an apolitical book. It was just the story of my family's life. And um, they, even though they were involved in the politics of Iran, you know, my one of my uncles became the Minister of Culture and Fine Arts. Another one became the head of the armed forces. But they weren't very political, you know. I mean, you could have these jobs and still not be political in that way. Um, so uh, that's how the book. I was trying to get the book so that it wouldn't have any, uh, you know. It's neither this or that. It's just a story. Fantastic. No, it, it really does a good job of going through all those um, tumultuous years in the history of of these two particular countries. Um, and, and the cultures within, within these two countries, but in a really um, objective, neutral way to really show the contributions and the challenges of, of the human spirit. And uh, as we know, we are a very sentimental um, nation. We pay a great deal of attention to our feelings and our emotions. And so reading the book really um, vivifies that sense of aliveness that that exists in our culture within the parameters of music and family love and romantic love and so you're absolutely correct that although it draws on the political upheavals uh, it in no way um, addresses anything from one angle or the, or the other so it's a very pleasant book to read it um, I suppose roots the passion that that you have had with Shaheen in bringing music as a gift to the world in many different um, ways um, to a whole new level. It gives it that sort of um, roots, as I mentioned, or really stability that, that your passions have tried to express over the years and perhaps can also become um, not only an inspiration to your family, whom, as you said, both your families so lovingly have tried to um, promote you, but also protect you from any uh, perhaps not so pleasant um, offshoots of, of just focusing on, on music rather than the many other talents that you both obviously have, but also it can be a source of assurance 
to parents of the current generation of Iranians, both in Iran and in among the diaspora, that the world of arts and culture, um, the world of music is actually uh, a very important contribution to the development of our nation. And it can really bring out those liberal values, those human values that are essential to not only our existence, but to our perpetual growth and development. So um, in fact, we uh, at Persia have another webinar coming up um, in the month of May, where Ali Mashayehi, um, oh. who's an Iranian filmmaker who is in, in Canada now, um, has been quite active in encouraging young Iranians to explore their passions about movie making. And he has an NGO that contributes to that. And just like the book that you have written, he's also coming forward to offer a webinar to give his contributions to encouragement and empowerment of the younger generation to pursue the arts and performing arts as a way of actually um, building a new civilization or, or regenerating the, the traditional values of the Iranian civilization. So with those thoughts in mind, I want to thank you again, both of you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, we will continue to post links to your music and also to your book on Persia social media, in particular, Instagram and Facebook. So that is available widely to anyone who's interested in purchasing the book or your music. Uh, we wish you the best of luck in everything that you do and thank you for keeping your passion for Iran and Iranian culture alive wherever you've been. Thank you again for taking part in Persia webinars. Thank you for the Thank opportunity. You, Dr. Danish. Thank you very much for the opportunity and a lovely uh, conversation. Thank you very much. Really, we appreciate that. And what your, your foundation is doing, we appreciate that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.